This is Channel 2, Salt Lake City. All today's news with Bob Evans, Michelle King, Mark Eubank has the weather. This is KUTV News. Good evening. It was one of the most bizarre scenes you can imagine, but then Ted Bundy was like no other man. And this morning, just after sunrise, the man suspected of brutally killing 36 women, many of them in Utah, met the long, drawn-out demands of justice. Bundy was executed before an atmosphere that was almost circus-like. KUTV's Bob Loy reports from the Florida State Prison near Stark. It was the morning people here have been anticipating for 10 bitter years. The Bay State Prison officials wired up the chair called Old Sparky and ordered Theodore Robert Bundy to take his seat. It's time for him to go. And now I have a daughter that lives in Lake City and I want him gone. For these Floridians, the execution was a chance to vent their anger and demonstrate their hatred toward the man responsible for at least three deaths here and the legal system that allowed Bundy to survive three previous death warrants ordering his execution. I'm saying that he ought to die, and all the ones that's over the honor protesting, even the judges and the jury, the ones that's all been against him and kept him alive this long, they should be done the same way as he's going to get if he gets it, and hope God he gets it. But, uh, celebrate his death. Damn right. And with the morning light spreading a soft glow across North Florida, celebrate they did. <laughs> Theodore Bundy was executed at 7.16 a.m. in the electric chair at Florida State Prison. Nearly 11 years to the day from the time he kidnapped, raped, and murdered a 12-year-old Lake City girl, Ted Bundy died. Some witnesses say he appeared shaken as he was led into the death chamber, but the prosecutor who won convictions against Bundy for murdering two Florida State University co-eds says the killer was ready to accept the ultimate moment of truth. The uh, hood, of course, was placed over him and the electrode strapped to his leg, and uh, Bundy throughout it all was very calm and appeared resigned to his fate. While most of the crowd was bloodthirsty, some took no joy in the execution. But the quiet protest of a few was overshadowed by those for whom the experience seemed almost a catharsis, therapy for the years of pain since Ted Bundy came into their lives. Now they believe the healing can begin. Ted Bundy's remains were carried by the White Hearse to a Gainesville, Florida mortuary. Before he died, he began considering himself a born-again Christian. He said he doubted the families of his victims would ever forgive him, but he believed God will. This is Bob Loy reporting live from the Florida State Prison near Stark. Bob, it's interesting to note that Ted Bundy killed more people in Washington and Utah than he did in Florida, but the outcry in Florida was much more vocal than it was here. Well, I was surprised by the size of the crowd here, but I wasn't really surprised by its intensity. For the people of North Florida, Ted Bundy is something and someone that they have lived and breathed for the last 10 years. All the media attention that has been brought on Bundy has also been brought on the people of North Florida. He was convicted near here at the prison. He uh, was, was captured near the prison. And it's something that they've lived with for quite some time. Surely the crimes that he committed here were no worse than the crimes he committed in Utah, Idaho, Colorado, or Washington. But it's that intensity that these people felt and lived for so long that I think brought out their intensity today. All right, Bob, thank you very much. Remarkably, the long-awaited execution of Theodore Bundy may have been only a secondary consideration in the minds of his victims' families and friends. Today, Salt Lake authorities reported the outcome of Sunday's hour-and-a-half-long interview with Bundy. KUTV's Brian Schiffer reports on what answers and what questions were raised by the interview. Bundy admitted to the homicide and kidnapping of uh, Wilcox girl and the Kent girl. From... Investigators have Bundy's confession. Debbie Kent, who disappeared from Viewmont High School, and Nancy Wilcox, who disappeared after running away from her holiday home, were victims of Bundy's lust for murder. I said, Debbie Kent, you went north, and Debbie Kent, now tell me about it. He says, yes, yes, we'll get into that. Uh, let's, let's look at the map here. Detective Dennis Couch talked with Bundy about the two victims for nearly an hour. 
Details about the crimes, where the bodies are located. He did bury them, and it was in a, both of them in uh, mountainous areas. Investigators have the locations roughly mapped out by Bundy himself. The bodies are located in southern and central Utah, in San Pete County, other locations mentioned in Kane and Washington County. We'll start a search for the bodies just as quick as we can look at the areas to see if the conditions are such that we can put people in there. We don't know how much snow is in those particular areas at this time. Bundy refused to talk about the murders of Laura Amy and Melissa Smith. Both cases will likely be closed. There is physical evidence that Bundy committed both crimes, eyewitness accounts and hair samples. The cases will be reviewed again by prosecutors. Lawmen say Bundy told a state officer in Florida of another victim in Utah and drew a map in the last hours of his life. Investigators are waiting for that information. The killer flatly denied another murder. Nancy Baird, a young mother, vanished in 1975 and was thought to be one of Bundy's victims. Her body was never found. It isn't that we're going to go here and wipe the slate clean on unsolved homicides. The only person or the only cases that will be cleared will be the ones that we can specifically tie Bundy to by either physical evidence or by his confessions. Other cases will remain open as investigators search for some link to Ted Bundy. There were just too many murdered and not enough time with the killer. The work is far from over tonight. At least three cases and as many as six remain open. Now, the Sheriff's Department is going to contact law enforcement agencies from all over the country who interviewed Bundy to see if, he ha see if they have any information on the Utah murders. Uh, with me now is Dennis Couch. Uh, he got Utah shot at Ted Bundy. Uh, Dennis, uh, the information from Florida first. Uh, can you give me the nature of that information and what you expect to find out? Uh, this, this morning I received a call from the uh, Deputy Superintendent of the State Prison in Florida. Shortly after the execution, he indicated that uh, he was with Mr. Bundy at approximately 5 a.m., and Mr. Bundy had uh, indicated that uh, he recalled another body in Utah, and he talked about that briefly, apparently, on an uh, audio tape, and then pinpointed the area where he thought uh, he left the body uh, here in Utah, and uh, these items are going to be sent to us uh, immediately. Ted Bundy, uh, as we all know, is a consummate liar. How do you know Ted Bundy is, was telling you the truth with the 90 minutes you spent with him? Well, he, uh, of course, t told, uh, told me about uh, murdering Debbie Kent and also uh, Nancy Wilcox. In the case of Debbie Kent, we have corroborating evidence such as a handcuff key uh, that was picked up at the uh, parking lot of the school up there that matched the handcuff that was on... Um, Durant. Also, there was uh, people in the school up there that uh, identified Bundy being in the area that evening. In the case of uh, Nancy Wilcox, um, I recall listening to a tape that uh, Hugh Ainsworth took of Mr. Bundy. He subsequently wrote a book, and in that he described on one of the tapes of a girl walking down a dimly lit street near a orchard and there was no sidewalks. Uh, this was precisely what Mr. Bundy told me in, uh, in the prison. Your, your impressions of, of Ted Bundy, you spent some time with him. I know there are some contrasts in your mind. Absolutely. Uh, Mr. Bundy on uh, Sunday evening when I was with him uh, was just the opposite that uh, he's always depicted, uh, especially in that courtroom uh, in Florida where he was the, the domineering, uh, dominant, defiant, bold individual. Uh, Sunday evening he was uh, very fatigued. You could tell he was uh, beaten and whipped and uh, quite uh, pensive at times. The unsolved cases, uh, do you expect that you'll ever see them solved with Ted Bundy gone? We're going to uh, continue to hope so and, and we only wish that uh, our trip would have been more fruitful. Thank you, Dennis. The investigation continues. I'm uh, sure uh, Sheriff Hayward and the other investigators will be gathering together. They're going to go down and uh, check the snow levels in the areas where the bodies are supposed to be. Uh, information will develop over the next few days. Uh, Bob, Michelle. Okay, thanks for your report, Brian. Of course, the people most interested in this investigation are the families of Bundy's victims. For some, there are no answers. For others, like Connie Wilcox, there is information that is hard to hear. Is it, is, was it just her, her body that would be there? Or what happens then? I certainly Seven hours after Bundy died, Connie Wilcox received word that her daughter oh, Nancy you. was indeed one of his victims. Okay. Investigators say they expect it's to recover like Nancy's death, remains. Actually, uh, because I never would admit or I wouldn't accept 
the fact that she really was dead. Now, I had to, I had to believe that in order to, to go on. I just could not. Uh, so this, this was like a new death for me. Connie Wilcox says her family plans on having a service for Nancy, a final farewell after 15 years. <laughs> on Bundy, well, Wilcox that, says that she did good. not hate yeah. him, but, but she does think he fought, deserved to die. Kind of now that same feeling seems to be shared among all the Utah families tragically linked to Ted Bundy. In many of those homes this morning, the lights came on early as they waited for word on Ted Bundy's fate. KUTV's Kathy Brock reports. Surely Amy hated Ted Bundy. Few people would blame her. Her daughter Laura was a possible victim of Bundy's terror in 1974. This morning, the Amys woke early at their house in Orem. The television and radio were turned on, but the past could not be tuned out. I'll, I'll be okay. Probably be all right after it's over with. Shirley thought this morning would bring some kind of peace. Instead, there were unexpected feelings, guilt for wanting a man to die. Please don't cry, Mom. Please. Bundy was scheduled to die in 1986, but he dodged the electric chair for two more years. That made this morning's wait more difficult, even harder than actually hearing that Bundy was dead. That was the reaction from some uh, people standing outside the prison in Stark, Florida, when they heard the news that Ted Bundy, one of the most notorious serial killers in the last quarter century, had been executed this morning. It's over with. I'm glad he's dead, but wasn't fun waiting for it. Kind of makes you feel like a Measure yourself because you're wanting it so bad. Wanting me dead so bad. The death penalty has been called society's revenge, but Amy says it is justice, the only legal way to end Ted Bundy's terror. At least I won't have to worry about him escaping. I won't have to worry about him ever getting out and killing any more girls. Just glad it's over. Kathy Brock, KUTV News, Orem. For Debbie Kent's family, the 15-year wait for news has been a living nightmare. Today, they had their suspicions confirmed. They told us this afternoon that Ted Bundy did, in fact, admit to killing and kidnapping 16-year-old Nancy Wilcox, 17-year-old Deborah Kent. I had no idea that the news would have such an effect on me, but when they called us today and told us, it was just like reliving a death, even though it happened 15 years ago. And feeling that feeling of your sister being dead. How did you feel when you actually heard Ted Bundy was dead? It felt really bad. I thought, you know, here's another life been taken because he de destroyed so many people. And it's such a tragedy to have that have to happen, you know. But he had to pay for his crimes, you know. He had to be put away. But I felt... I don't know, I felt very sad. I just had a hollow, empty feeling this morning. Can you ever forgive Ted Bundy? I don't think you would forgive him. You would say you pity the man that he was so distraught that he let his life be so destroyed that he didn't go for help. I don't think you'd ever want to forgive him, basically, and that's probably not a good Christian, but how can you forgive someone that does that to you? It's a terrible thing to, to, to be driving down the road and and just to have a commentator bring up Ted's name and talk about him. And it, and it, it makes you sick every time that that occurs, and I think that that'll be behind us now. The Kent's porch light has burned for Debbie since the day she disappeared. Tonight it's no different, but at least now the Kent's say that they have an inner peace that they haven't felt in some 15 years. While Bundy's statements have helped clear up several old cases in which he was a suspect, many others remain just as mysterious as ever. For the families of the victims of these crimes, the anguish of not knowing what happened continues. Jackie Brown blames the police for not finding out whether Bundy was involved in the death of her sister, Kathy Harmon. Kathy Harmon died in 1976 when Bundy was out on bail on a Salt Lake kidnapping charge. Her body was discovered in the canyon. She had been strangled and raped. What I'm upset about is that I called to make sure that they would ask, and I don't even think that they ask unless Pete Hayward wants to call me back and 
confirm that he did ask, then I still think that he has not done anything about it. He's not looked into it. So you're angry with the police? Yes. I think that we were put on the back burner because my family didn't make a big deal about it. They were hurt. They didn't want to talk about it. And so I wonder if he thinks it wasn't worth looking into. I don't know. A neighbor at the time of the murder reported seeing near the house a man who might fit Bundy's description. Ted Bundy's last recorded interview, an interview done last night, was released today. Portions of that meeting as our coverage continues. I can't begin to understand. Well, I can try, but I, I'm aware that I can't begin to understand the pain. Ted Bundy's death row confession has cleared Idaho murder files of a 14-year-old case, one in which he was never a suspect. Just two days before his execution, he confessed to killing 12-year-old Lynette Culver of Pocatello. KUTV's Von Roche has just returned from Idaho where he interviewed the girl's father. Von? Bob, in confessing, some truly believe Bundy wanted to give something back to his victim's family. Answer, answer the unresolved questions. In talking to Lynette Culver's father, I was told Bundy's confession gave nothing back, merely accounted for what he took away. She looked like many of Bundy's victims, long hair framing a youthful face. At 12, Lynette Culver was one of the youngest. She disappeared from school May 6, 1975, never to be seen again. And though her family now knows who killed her, the question asked in 14 years of headlines may never be answered. Bundy said he dumped her body in the Snake River. And as you know, there's been a Teton dam flood through that river and things like that. So the possibility of recovery is virtually nil. Edward Culver will never be able to bury his daughter, a bitter fact that will not be changed by Bundy's execution. It's no relief to know that he's dead. That doesn't change anything. And uh, why not? Why would it? The kid's not here. Culver spoke with reserve about his feelings for his daughter. He's felt the pain for 14 years. He's learned to hide it. He focuses now on the victims who live. The kid was not the only victim. Her whole family was a victim. All the families of all those other girls are still the victims as well. His concern also is for the living Bundys and their victims. There are Lots more of them out there hurting other people's sisters and other people's daughters. Um, until we as a community and a nation do something drastically to solve those problems, uh, there's not going to be a sense of security in any household with a 12-year-old girl in it. Bundy confessed to a second Idaho murder of a young woman he found hitchhiking. Idaho investigators say they may never confirm that story, but then it's possible the remains of someone else's daughter are washing down an Idaho river. Bob? Vaughn, thank you. It's been nine and a half years since Bundy was sentenced to death. Our legal system provides for what seems like an unending string of appeals to ensure that all avenues are pursued before a person is executed. KUTV's Deborah Linda reports on the continued frustration with the appeals process. The only feelings I have that uh, Ted has gotten just exactly what he deserved. If anybody ever fit the death penalty as such, uh, Ted Bundy did. Salt Lake County yes, Sheriff uh, Pete Hayward expressed it bluntly, but he and much of the public have wondered why has it taken almost a decade for Bundy's execution to be carried out. Cases ought to be litigated, they ought to be tried, and after the appeal is through, there ought to be finality. And finality gives everyone a sense of peace. BYU law professor Michael Goldsmith says you don't have to be a staunch supporter of the death penalty to question a system which allows four death warrants and ten years of appeals. It seems to me, however, that if you're going to have a death penalty at all, that from the standpoint of fairness and equity to the family involved, and even in a sense to the, to the condemned prisoner, that the process ought to be expedited. While it may seem long to those who are demanding uh, death, uh, to those who are doing the work, to those who are preparing and, and carrying out the legal uh, preparation that is necessary, 
it's a very short period of time. It Gil Athe is no stranger to the long appeals process. He was alongside Dale Pierre Selby until the hi-fi killer's execution in 1987 and is a member of a unique circle of attorneys who take on capital cases without pay out of a strong conviction that the death penalty is wrong. Bundy has to be probably the most despicable human being ever to have walked the face of the earth. I, I, I'm not going to say anything kind about him at all because there's nothing kind that can be said about him. What he did was, was condemnable under any standard, but, but to me that fact alone does not justify a death penalty. One Florida newspaper put the total amount at $7 million spent on prosecuting and appealing Bundy's case and on housing him. Add to that the 100,000 man hours spent by investigators in four states and the cost of the legal process has been staggering. Hundreds of inmates continue to sit on death row in prisons across the country. Many are without legal representation. Meanwhile, the appellate process, flawed as it may be, will undoubtedly continue as long as there are attorneys around who believe in abolishing the death penalty and who think that their case may be the one to do it. Deborah Lindner, KUTV News. An ironic note to this long trail to the chair. Ten years ago, Ted Bundy negotiated a plea bargain that would have jailed him for life, but the deal fell through primarily after Bundy tried to remove his public defender from the case. Bundy claimed that the defender was trying to coerce him into admitting guilt. One of the last things Ted Bundy did in his life was grant an interview to James Dobson, the host of a California-based talk show. Dobson represents a fundamentalist organization called Focus on the Family. Among other things, he preaches the evils of pornography. Today, Dobson released that interview. KUTV's Bob Lloyd joins us again from Stark, Florida with more on the story. Bob? Bob. Bundy was interviewed yesterday just hours before he was executed, as Bundy put it, in the valley of the shadow of death. His responses reveal the man in a way that has never been publicly seen before. It's powerful stuff in which Bundy delves into the feelings of the families of his victims and his own views on the death of Ted Bundy. I can't begin to understand the pain that the parents of these, of these children that I have and these young women that I have harmed feel. And I can't restore really much to them, if anything. I won't pretend to, and I don't even expect them to forgive me, and I'm not asking for it. The, that kind of forgiveness is of God, and if they have it, they have it. If they don't, well, maybe they'll find it someday. I don't want to die. I'm not going to kid you. I'll kid, kid you not. Um, I deserve certainly the the most extreme punishment society has and I deserve I think society deserves to be protected from me and from others like me that's for sure uh, I think what I what I hope will come of our discussion is I think society deserves to be protected from itself Bundy's words seem profound but equally profound are the feelings and thoughts of the families of the victims who now know that society has protected itself against Ted Bundy. Bob? All right, Bob, thank you very much again. KUTV will broadcast that interview in its entirety immediately following KUTV News at 10 tonight. Michelle? It's been 15 years since Bundy left Utah and the questions began. 15 years of wondering if Utah's missing girls were really Bundy's victims or if one day they'd walk in the front door. KUTV's Michael Rawson reports that Bundy attacked long ago, but he left impressions and scars that will not easily go away. They died because of the way they parted their hair, because of their generous dispositions, and because some psychologists said they smiled like the killer's mother. They were taken from nice homes in middle-class neighborhoods, surroundings the killer was comfortable in. Their broken bodies were discarded as though they were broken dolls thrown away in remote places so lawmen and the girls' families would never know. In Utah, he took a shy teenager, a rebellious one, a police chief's daughter, and a girl who aspired to be a social worker. There are other victims also that police are just now learning about, and many more victims that are not counted in police files. Uh, it's just practically destroyed my life. Uh... 
uh, mentally as as well as physically. And uh, De Deb was on my mind constantly and, and occupies much of it uh, even today. Dean Kent survived the anguish. Other fathers did not. Jim Amy died on the 13th anniversary of his daughter Laura's death. Doctors say it was a heart attack. His family says Jim Amy died of a broken heart. Midvale Police Chief Lewis Smith never resolved the bitterness over his daughter, Melissa, being taken by Ted Bundy. I don't want another parent to go through what my wife and I went through. I don't, I don't think that's right. That isn't justice. And I think that he will murder another girl, and I think the death penalty is a deterrent, and I'm very pleased that the jury had enough guts to recommend it. Ah! Lewis Smith died in 1985. Friends say his soul had been destroyed 11 years before by Bundy. I think to a degree his life stopped the day his daughter died. I think that it totally destroyed the, the real man that Lewis Smith once was. Bundy would likely have killed many more women had he not been stopped for erratic driving in Salt Lake City in the summer of 1975. Detectives found a crowbar, handcuffs, and a pantyhose ski mask in his car as well as microscopic hair samples from at least one of his victims. Carol Durant picked Bundy out of a lineup as the man posing as a police officer who abducted her from a shopping mall. Ms. Durant was one of very few women ever to escape Bundy's clutches. Her story and Bundy's first arrest began lawmen on their horrifying journey into madness and murder. In Colorado, following a jailbreak and another arrest, Bundy had a few words of sympathy for the victims that he steadfastly denied killing. And I really feel for them because apparently they suffered some uh, an incredible tragedy in their lives. The loss of a loved one is, is probably, probably the most extreme kind of loss you can suffer in, in this life. And I say I, I feel as much for them as anybody can. After this interview, Bundy would kill again. Two young college women and a 12-year-old Florida girl. He would haunt police as he did so many families. Susan Curtis disappeared from BYU in 1975. Her family and investigators always suspected Bundy, but they will never know for sure. I always wonder, could I have done something more? Did I miss something? Uh, I've always struggled with that. I, I, I wish that I had been able to put it to rest for the parents. And they hoped that it could have been uh, resolved uh, happily. Uh, and I, I cannot imagine what they've been going through. Many of the young women died without funerals. Mothers and fathers have never been permitted to bury their daughters. Part of Bundy's legacy are gravestones without bodies. Now, after 14 years, there is some hope that the Kent family and others will finally lay their girls to rest. I just need that. I think we all do as a family. We all want to know this is Deb's body and it's in this grave and this is where she is. Connie Wilcox yeah. mourns yeah. for her daughter and for all of the unborn children of Bundy's victims. You look at all of the uh, little uh, children that were not... Uh, that, that were denied the opportunity of being born because of these girls dying. And I think of the little grandchildren that, that Nancy would have brought uh, to our home like our other children do, and that makes me angry. In Bountiful, the porch light will continue to burn as a reminder of all the young women who never came home. It seems like all of these girls are crying out to you, like they're just, like they're begging and asking for help in getting peace of mind. Michael Rawson, KUTV News. Ted Bundy's mother, Louise, says she still can't figure out what went wrong. In an interview with a Seattle television station yesterday, she expressed confusion at how a fun-loving and caring son could turn into a ruthless killer. There's nothing in his background that, that can tell us what triggered all of this. In fact, up until... Saturday, I didn't believe any of it. Louise Bundy was thousands of miles away from her son when he was executed this morning. She says it would have been too painful. It's a three-ring circus, if not a ten-ring circus. And we didn't feel the agony we would go through by going down there would compensate for a few minutes of talking to Ted through glass. And he also felt that way, too. 
Mrs. Bundy always believed her son was innocent, and when he confessed to the killings before his death, she was shocked. We were angry for a while yesterday, even this morning, that we were, that he never confided in us. Of course, if he had, what would we have done then? Mm -hmm. You don't usually go around telling your mom that you've been doing these kinds of things. That I understand, but for 13 years, he's sworn up and down, backwards and forwards, that he was innocent. And then and all of a sudden, him. we believed him, we wanted to believe him. He's still our son, no matter what he's done, and we love him very much. Up until this weekend, Louise Bundy thought Ted was the perfect son. Bundy fooled most everyone who knew him. How he could maintain outward appearances while committing murder puzzles them. His was a complex, disturbed mind. KUTV's Larry Warren reports. This guy is totally consumed with murder 24 hours a day. What turned this young man from a good family in Tacoma into one of the most savage mass murderers in American history? He once said he wanted to be locked up and studied so the world would never again see another one like him. But that didn't happen. He takes to his grave the mystery of his mind. There are clues like the death row interviews he gave two authors, interviews in which he could speak of himself only in the third person. He would be out in society viewing and being exposed to the television ads and the girly magazines and you know, the, the women in hot pants in the streets and all these things that, that tended to nurture his condition, exacerbated, agitated. Bundy was a window peeker, read softcore pornography, then hardcore. He told his last interviewer last night he was addicted to pornography and developed a fantasy life. Fantasies developed. And the fantasies were at first very, very crude and unformed kinds of uneasiness or whatever that could not be satisfied by simply looking at a naked woman. In real life, he was not fitting in, quiet, withdrawn, with low self-esteem. His fantasy life was his escape, and gradually it overtook him. It's another step to visualize that beautiful woman as being the victim of some kind of violent activity. What's not being recognized is that slowly, imperceptibly again, that the very basic inhibitions about engaging in this kind of conduct are being eroded. And at some point, perhaps now as early as 1970, he turned what was a friendly, voluntary sexual encounter with a woman into murder. After the first sexual encounter, gradually his, his sexual desire builds back up and joins those other unfulfilled desires and uh, wanting to fulfill this other need to totally possess her, as it were, as she lay there because of, you know, just strangled her there. The actual murdering itself was not what he was after. You have a two, you have a two part thrill, if you will. The hunt, the, the fantasy hunt, right? The possession of the girl and then the enactment of the fantasy with the lifeless body over hours or days until she has to be disposed of. Once they've crossed that line, which is killing the first victim, it, it, it hurts on one hand to them, hurts them, but on the other hand, they found a deep gratification in this. There was a release in anger. I've had some people who have told me as they killed a victim, they said there was a deep sense of peace that they felt in doing so. That feeling of relief in having set loose the urge to kill may be why Bundy outwardly could seem so engaging, so innocent in appearance. At the time, KUTV's Lucky Severson interviewed him in 1977, Bundy had already killed perhaps two dozen women. I don't like being locked up for something I didn't do, and I don't like my liberty taken away, and I don't like being treated like an animal, and I don't like, like people walking around and ogling me like I'm some sort of weirdo, because I'm not. They compartmentalize. They'll take the things they've done and psychologically lock them in the next room and shut the door and not think about them. We see the same thing with a certain number of sex offenders and they'll convince themselves almost that I haven't done these things. But I've kept it together because there's no point in destroying myself. I have got to keep myself together. I have got to stay calm. I've got to keep my presence of mind 
because as long as I do that, I'm going to beat these people. In the end, his overwhelming urges led him on the Chi Omega sorority house rampage, an act so reckless he may have done it on purpose to make sure he finally got stopped. I think he was born to kill. Uh, there was just, I don't know if it's a bad seed or what, but boy, he's, he is just uh, totally consumed with murder. Um, all the time. He had to be. His uh, constant behavior, his constant searching for victims, uh, constant visits to the dump sites, those type of things, totally consumed his life. The mystery of what drove Bundy died with him this morning. And to those who've studied him over the years, one impression remains. How does such an outwardly normal person do such outrageous acts. People think that a criminal should look like a criminal, you know, that people who are, who are dangerous look dangerous, and he didn't look dangerous. He looked like the rest of us. I feel good about myself. I'm happy with myself. Larry Warren, KUTV News. The life and crimes of Theodore Robert Bundy will be with us for a very long time, even if we are able to put him out of mind. Five journalists across this country have devoted years to putting the Bundy story in books, five in all. Hollywood did Bundy like it usually does these types of things. They produced a primetime miniseries and hired a tall, handsome former star athlete to play the deliberate stranger. Yes, there will be plenty of reminders of a man whose psyche has resisted all analysis. Last night, Ted Bundy told a radio talk show host that he believed God had forgiven him. At the least, we can hope that God is the one who can figure Ted Bundy out. KUTV News continues in a minute.